The little ones are welcome to go with Miss Cheryl around to their time as well. Let's pray. Lord, would you give us would you give us your spirit? Would you give us yourself and let us have time with you, a living time, Lord, with your with your living resurrected self. Bless you, Jesus. Amen. So last weekend, I was away on a retreat, and Eric, Eric Kiefer and I were away on a retreat last weekend, and that was super. I just, I realized, I didn't realize, you know, do you ever have this experience, you don't realize until you get there how bad you need it? I realized I didn't realize how much I needed it. I've just been sort of carrying and grieving over so many things. Some of those I've shared with you guys already. I've been grieving over this whole thing in Ukraine and the heaviness of that. I was, uh, I love this. This is so good. It's good. So every Sunday morning, I don't know why, every Sunday morning my phone tells me what my average use is for the prior week. And it tells me while I'm busy doing this. And one of the ways that I realized how badly I'm grieving these things is by the amount of time I've been on my phone for the past week. Because I'm, a lot of it's on the news. A lot of it is checking in stuff. I found these Ukrainian reporters and others on Twitter, and I've been, been just following them. I'm not going to tell you what the daily number is, because frankly, this morning I was shocked. I was, oh my word. It was embarrassing. And that was actually even like, it said, oh, your use is down, you know? It's only this much per week. I thought, oh my goodness. So I realized I've been carrying this stuff and I've been sharing with you guys some of that. I also, I realized when I got to the retreat, I just realized like I am so grieved over the number of sex and abuse scandals that keep coming out in the church. I'm not talking about any one of them. But the simple fact that I can say I'm not talking about any one of them, and you all know what I mean, is the point. Get it? The simple fact that I can say I'm not just talking about any one of them, and we're like, yeah, I know, there's so many of them. And I didn't get into this for that. I got into this because I and you and we and people want God for his own sake, good heavens, right? We want to know his love. We want to connect. It's worth more than that. And I realize what I'm grieving about is that, you know, the next one comes to light and the next one comes to light and the next one comes to light and nothing changes. And I want to say, folks, why don't we do something actually, say, I don't know, biblical, like sackcloth and ashes, like fall down before the Lord and say, have mercy on us. We have a sickness in the church writ large. And I know, look, I know. I've taken hits for this in other places where I called it early and held the line or similar. And I know other pastors who've done the same. And if, and if you're one of those, you just want to say, you know, we didn't do it. But writ large, we have a sickness. And I want to say, let's honor God enough to grieve it and name it and own it. We've all got our things that we want to ask Jesus about when we get there, right? One of the ones I want to ask Jesus about is where he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you as well, right? And you know what he's doing there. He's given us a, a challenge line, but he's, but he's also kind of reassuring us. I want to say there's half of me that wishes he hadn't reassured us. And the reason is because I think, given what we humans are, we flip it on him, don't we? We start saying, gosh, we've got to do this God thing because I really do want that other stuff as well. I really want things to work out. I really want our nation to get straightened out. I really want this, or I really want that, or I want to know that God's going to take care of me. So deep in our deceitful hearts, we flip it on him. And we do the God thing, not for God's sake, not because God deserves it, not because his love is so great, not because he's awesome and tremendous and holy and other and all the things that he is. We do it deep inside. We don't admit it to ourselves, but we do. We do it deep inside in order to get the other things as well. 
And the irony, of course, is Jesus, it doesn't work that way, right? As soon as you do that, you've got it backwards, you've got it twisted, and it doesn't work. So I show up to this retreat. <laughs> bless, bless Eric, whereas Eric Kiefer's with me. Bless him. Eric's like, I think I've come with a loaded animal. I don't know. Like, you know, like, I think Eric's over there saying, do I have to spend the whole weekend with, you know, like, with you? Or can I, like, spend the weekend with others in the mix, right? I get to this retreat. And this retreat is with the School of Formation for uh, New Life Church in Queens. Now, somebody found this book. This is the pastor, his, his first book. And, um, and we used this when we began. It's called The Deeply Formed Life. And the reason we used it is because it's about taking this stuff seriously. It's about getting this stuff into your life, arranging your life to walk with God, to have a deeply formed life with God. So we used this book for discussions as we got Trinity going. So Eric and I decided to walk with them through sort of their cohort course over these nine months. Everybody in the world's doing cohorts. They're good things. Everybody's doing them. They did a good one. And so this is their retreat to sort of sum it up at the end. So we go to this retreat, and they did a brilliant job with the retreat. Now, I have a rule of thumb for myself. I have a rule of thumb that you do not try to tell people about retreats. Because no matter what, it's like when you're standing at the gorgeous sunset at the beach and you try the panorama picture and it just still doesn't do it, right? You're better off just don't take a picture, just enjoy it. It's there, it's just there for you and God in that moment. And I think retreats are like that. I'm going to violate my rule this morning and share a little bit with you about the retreat, even though I'm painfully aware of how inadequate it will be. So my apologies, but I asked the Lord and I think he told me to do this, so... Eric and I were talking this morning. He's already struck this building with lightning once, so I think we're safe. <laughs> lightning never strikes twice in the same place, so I think, I think we're safe here. Um, that didn't occur to me until this morning, but I'm like, wow, we could have been doing who knows what, right? <laughs> like, Lord's like, shoot, I just can't get them. <laughs> We've already done that building. Anyway, um, where am I going? I'm sorry. You guys are, are going to be like, can we have Tim before the retreat back? Um, so we go to this retreat, and they did a great job with it. Because what they did was they said, look, we're finally all together in person. So a lot of you are from all over the place, so you never met each other. And they said, we've been feeding you lots and lots of content over the months. So what we're going to do here is we're going to give you some space to, to talk about it, to share about it, and to sit with the Lord. So thing A... We're going to frame this moment, then you get two hours by yourself. So two hours by myself. Eric and I had already done our exploring. This place was on a gorgeous Catholic seminary on Long Island, 260-something acres. And the way that the Catholics build these things is they have this gorgeous chapel in the middle, big, huge, you know, like big church-sized chapel in the middle, and then these wings branching off where people would stay and stuff. And they'd have the cafeteria and the gym and all this other stuff in the wings. So Eric and I, we'd already gone out and explored around, and we had found the chapel, and then we found the chapel under the chapel, which is the bishop's chapel. And you go in the bishop's chapel, and it's gorgeous. And I, 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 I love this stuff, so we go, we went and we're exploring. And you go in, and it's this little chapel, a lot of marble, wonderful altar up front, six mini chapels along the way, St. Dominic, St. Francis, you know, St. Catherine of Alexandria, St. Thomas Aquinas, and, you know, you work your way up the food chain. You get to, you know, Peter and Paul, and then you got the altar proper. And it's, I love it. I, just, I love this stuff. I mean, they've got, they've got candelabras in here that make our little, um, you know, this is a homemade deal that we bought at one of those, you know, shinchi stores in the mall. And then I put it on the drill press and drilled out a hole for the, you know, no, they got stuff that's this tall, made of brass. You know, it's amazing. It weighs a ton. must have cost who knows what, right? This place is gorgeous. And part of me is just soaking all this up. I just, I love this stuff. And you pass through that, and you come into the crypt. And the crypt is mostly blocked off, but it's the first three bishops of Brooklyn. This, this is all important. That's why I'm sure I'm not sharing this for fun. It's important. So it's, it's a crypt for three bishops. It's called the Bishop's Chapel. Stay with me. You go through that, and you come to an adoration chapel. Anybody know what an adoration chapel is? You will if you don't. We, we will become the Adoration Chapel Anglicans at some point. Adoration chapels are places you go in and the blessed Eucharist is there and you just, you just sit in silence and adore the Lord Jesus. 
So go in this adoration chapel. I love them. I haven't been in an adoration chapel in forever. So I get two hours. I go boom straight for the adoration chapel. And I sit down. And this room is incredible. Right? And I'm feeling distracted. So I'm having this conflict inside where I'm just noticing how gorgeous the room is. The marbles, the, the art and all this stuff. And I'm, and I'm feeling conflicted though because that's speaking to me of church. And I'm frustrated as the Dickens with church. And I want to meet Jesus. So I'm sitting there having this conflicted experience in the Adoration Chapel. And up front they have a mosaic. And the mosaic, I, I began to be distracted by this mosaic because it's really, really gorgeous. And it's really well done. I came home and looked it up and I found out it was done by Hildreth Miere, who I don't know who that was except once I started reading into it. And a and hundred-ish years ago, she's the leading mosaic artist in the U.S. And she was commissioned by the Diocese of Brooklyn to do this mosaic. And it's Oh, it's good. It's so good. So I'm sitting there, and I find myself drawn to this mosaic. And, and I'm frustrated by that. I'm saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I'm trying to focus, trying to focus. But I keep going back to the mosaic, and then I notice something. The mosaic is Jesus in majesty. It's the resurrected Jesus on the throne at the end in majesty. What I saw that I had missed up until that point shocked me. Before him is a collapsed cathedral. Before him is a bishop's mitre, the strange hats bishops wear, that's on the ground and collapsing under its own weight, if you will. Think about that. This is a bishop's chapel to honor bishops beside a crypt for bishops. And yet they're acknowledging that in spite of all that we do and all that we are and the best that we might be able to bring, nonetheless, it's not going to all get straightened out until the resurrected Jesus comes back. And I'm, I'm just more conflicted. I'm sitting there, I'm saying, thank you, Jesus. On the one hand, I'm, I'm in awe. And this is why I did pray about this seriously. I said, Lord, do you want me to share this? Because normally this stuff's just for you and whoever you give it to. And I think he said, no, share a little bit of this. So I'm, I'm sitting there, and partially I'm in awe because I realize, like, God's been waiting for me to get there. He's been waiting for this retreat to happen. He's been waiting for me to get into, he sort of he sort of led Eric and I in there, like, hey, look at this, hey, look at this, hey, look at this. So I knew to go in there, but I didn't notice this part of the mural until right then. He's just sort of waiting. So part of me is feeling like, in oh, wow, God, you've been setting this up just for us. But part of me is feeling really conflicted because the last time I preached, before I went on the retreat, I talked about rapture theology and what a disaster it is, and it is, right? And I'm sitting there, I'm going, but Lord, I don't want to go back to being dualistic either. How do we sort this out? Are you with me? Do you get the tension? How do we sort this out? And so God and I began a wonderful little dialogue. I said, I said God, you know, I, I really love this stuff. I love the beauty of this. I love this stuff. And... and God said, yeah, I know. He said, honor the sacramental, honor the sacred, but don't be slave to it. Honor it, not because people have always done it, not because it looks neat, not because it's esoteric. Honor it because you find me in it, and it connects me to you. Inasmuch as for your community, it connects me and you, honor it. Inasmuch as it makes holy space where people's souls can be safe and can relax and can open up, honor it. I said, okay, that works, that makes sense. I said, hey, hey God, what about justice, right? Like, I really, really care about justice. I mean, I'm on my phone too much because I'm, you know, 
working on the news. And, you know, I just, I cannot not see the big picture. It just doesn't work for me. I can't do it. I can't get up on Mother's Day and not preach about the big picture. It's just not in me. God's like, okay, I care about justice too. Yeah, it does matter. He says, learn, Tim, learn to live for justice out of love. Learn to live, work, fight for justice out of love. I said, okay, that's good. So then I said, well, God, I got one more, right? I said, you, I said you, you know, you know, in your creation, you deemed your creation to be good. You said it was good and even very good. You know that Romans 8 promises us that in the end, the very creation itself will be redeemed and it yearns for your return and your triumph and your revelation of yourself so that it can be set free. I said, I really, you know, I don't want to get dualistic about that. I don't want to say, well, you know, who cares? It's all going to burn up. And I don't want to go back in that zone. And he said, yeah, care for the earth, care for the non-human creation. You will learn humility. You will learn patience. You will learn a different pace. You'll learn what I wanted a human being to be in the first place when I told you to keep and guard the garden. So he said, yeah, do that stuff, and you'll work a soul that can more easily love. But I said, okay, God, these are good. Thanks. Like, these are great. I mean, this is amazingly good. And what's amazing about this is it's just happening so quietly. It's literally like a conversation. I don't mean, that, I don't mean it's audible, but I mean it's just, just right there. He's just, he's just been waiting for this moment. So I said, but, I mean, there must be something we do that abides, right? Like, we work so hard, and we care, and we invest. There must be something we do that abides. He's just, uh, mm-hmm. oh, right, you already told us that. I already knew that. Faith, hope, and love, these three abide, but the greatest of these is love. He said, yep, there you go. I already told you that one. So I'm scribbling all this stuff down in my journal. I've got two hours to be with the Lord. I'm done in 30 minutes. In a profound but not drastic or dramatic way, I'm done in 30 minutes. Like, in a good way. Sat, you know, satisfied. I'm like, Lord, you got anything else? Nope, that's it. We're done. So, okay, what am I going to do? He said, well, go explore. You like to explore? I said, go explore. So I'm going to tell you guys a secret. All right? Rich and I, Rich and I had already talked about playing ball. So I found the gym, and unbeknownst to him, I got warmed up. Because I had an extra hour and a half, so when it came time to play, I beat him. Two out of two games. I think, I think it troubled him. So I told him, I said, you know, it's okay. I said, in the game that really matters to pastors, you, like, killed me exponentially. You know, your, your first book sold, like, Tens of times more than my first book did. So, you, so, you know, it was, you win. Sorry. That's just a fun thing. So all of this stuff, I felt the Lord in this Easter season, in this resurrection time, saying, yes, the health of the church matters. Yes, the community of the church matters. Yes, the way we live in the world matters. But still, but still, It will only be sorted when I return. And don't let life get flattened out. The resurrection hope is the breakthrough that makes all the difference. What we're doing in this Eastertide is we're looking at some of Paul's letters to individual churches, and we're seeing how resurrection makes a difference. Romans 8 is arguably the greatest place in the whole New Testament where this breaks through, if you will, or rather where Paul says the breakthrough has happened. He says there's no longer any condemnation. You are loved. You are known. Yes, you'll never get there perfectly, but you are in. My resurrection opens up a new path. He says, in fact, it's so different that you have the Spirit now. 
and you cry out to me, Abba, Daddy. You're no more fatalism. You know me. You are my child. We are tight. In fact, no matter what happens, we're so tight, we're so connected, that it's true that no matter what happens, even your sufferings pale in comparison that the, to the glory that will be revealed in you, in us. Paul says that our sufferings cannot be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. Even the whole of creation, not just the human soul, yearns in some mysterious way for this breakthrough to be consummated and manifest. And everything will be made new. And then at the end, he says, nothing can separate you from the love of God. And he gives us quite the list, doesn't he? Height, depth, happy, sad, big, little, anxiety, distress, shame, falling apart, whatever. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. You get the little thing Paul does here in Romans 8 that he doesn't do anywhere else. He says, Jesus Christ is the one who died. I think we ought to make that capital O, capital W, capital D, the one who died. Paul says, Jesus Christ is the one who died, hyphen, more than that. More than that. He's seated on the throne at the right hand of God, interceding for us. In one place, Paul says that the cross is the power of God. In one place, Paul says that I knew nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul is committed to the cross. And yet he says more than that, he was raised. Yes, he's the one who died, but more than that, he's the one who was raised. And that's what makes the difference. That's what changes the energy. That's what changes the horizon. That's what changes everything. So Jesus, raised in heaven, interceding, saying to the Father, hey, have you, have you, seen, have you seen my so-and-so? Look what's going on in her life. Look what's going on in his life. We've got to, we've got to be near to them. He's up there interceding in some crazy, mysterious way, and it means you are known and you are seen. And whatever's going on with you, you're not alone in it. So we're at the retreat. Thank you guys for letting me share so much. We come back from this time, and it's a time for people to share. Now, normally in this place, this is with a church out of Queens. I have 78 ethnicities in this church. And I'm a little bit on the older end of folks in the room, and I'm definitely on the whiter end of folks in the room. And I live in a relatively wealthy part for folks in the room. Relatively, So I tend to not say a lot. I tend, I'm, I'm, I'm cross-cultural. I'm learning. I'm listening. That's why I'm there. I get to talk a lot anyway. I'm up here talking. So most of the time I don't share. But this time I felt like the Lord was just nudging me to share. So I shared super briefly about Trinity. Some of the folks knew the story. A lot of them didn't. And I shared it was our one-year anniversary and how we got going and what we cared about and all the rest. I had these folks from New York City, black, Puerto Rican, Latino, folks out of Queens, folks out of Brooklyn, folks living in various places in the city, coming up to me all weekend saying, thank you guys. Thank you. Essentially, they said, thank you for taking our pain seriously. Thank you for taking a step that cost you something. Thank you for living into this in a real way. It's like... It, it's, it's worth it. It was worth it already. I was already having fun. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. So, so worth it for these folks to tell us that they're encouraged. So I watched, I just watched them. I just watched them over the weekend. The, the community, most of these folks from New Life Church, I just watched them. What I saw was a lovely community. A lovely community where you can be yourself, you can be honest, you can be real, you can struggle. And people were alive. 
And it's, it's, it's like you see organic soil in their soul. So I'm just about done. I just want to say, I'm going to walk through the whole thing. I just want to say the two great pillars of the book of Romans. It's like, it's like the Zechim Bridge. I've said this before. You get two great br- pillars. The whole bridge hangs off of it. Romans 8 and Romans 12. Romans 8, more than that, more than that, he's, re- he's resurrected. Romans 8 leads to Romans 12 living. Romans 8, these incredible truths about the hope and the open horizon lead to Romans 12. Offer yourselves as living sacrifices. Do not be conformed to the schematics of this world, but let your life be a liturgy, a space where God is real in the world. The word is literally a liturgy. Let your God be, let your life be a space where God is present in the world. And then he moves from that concentric circle, tightest one, how, you know, how do I connect to the ultimate? It is how do you see yourself? See yourself as walking this life in God's spirit. And then he talks about how love each other. Let love be genuine. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And then he moves out to say, everybody has gifts. We all have gifts. We're all in. And then he says, all of you here relate to the world in the way that you pray for those who persecute you. You bless everyone. He works his way all the way down to essentially a bumper sticker to sum it up at the end of the chapter. Anybody know what it is? Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's essentially a bumper sticker summing up Romans 12. Romans 8, friends, gives us the ability to live Romans 12. Living Romans 12 is living fully alive in the spirit of Jesus. The Lord showed me this wonderful community over the weekend, and then he said, you guys are one here. You're a baby one here. Keep going. Live into it. Keep going. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that Paul can say, Jesus Christ is the one who died. Thank you for dying. We praise you, Jesus, that Paul can also say more than that who has been raised. More than that who has been raised. So I invite you friends in your heart and mind right now just to adore the Lord Jesus. I invite you in your own heart just to say Praise you, Jesus, you are alive. Praise you, Lord, you have opened up the future. Just say, Lord, you're so beautiful. 